Thank you. Uh, so I will begin with uh, explaining how this algebraization theorem, algebraistic criterion is proved. Um, and uh, so this will be a Diophantine approximation argument. Uh, but uh, let me even start with something like a baby case uh, of this principle of uh, playing out the uh, integrality of coefficients against some analyticity to get a, a, a algebraicity conclusion. So this lemma, uh, so this will be a trivial lemma, uh, but it has, uh, let me just state it. So suppose we have an integer power series again. Uh, and which is uh, also a bounded analytic function on uh, the unit complex disk. Then what can we say? It makes a good uh, complex analysis homework assignment. It says, well, then uh, these are exactly the polynomials. This is a polynomial. Separately, of course, we have um, continue many integer power series uh, which are holomorphic on the unit disk, but they will not be bounded. And also a whole subject called bounded analytic functions with complex coefficients on the uh, unit disk. When the two uh, uh, properties meet, we get, sorry, we get an algebraistic conclusion. And here I have, a, I just mean to say, f is uh, in z x polynomial. And the proof of that, uh, okay. One line, Parseval. So, uh, or in other, uh, so sometimes one applies the, push, the, 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 sorry, the integral formula of Cauchy against uh, 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 the principle of Liu view that uh, non zero integer is at least one in magnitude. Here it's simply that we take uh, limit, limit uh, tends to one uh, from below, uh, and then uh, you integrate the absolute value square of this function, sorry. Uh, in the circle, on the circle of radius r, in the uniform measure. Uh, and of course that converges to uh, the, well, norm square. Well, this is bounded by assumption. This is less than infinity. And so we get that only finitely many of the coefficients are non-zero because these coefficients are integers. That's the proof. But, uh, so this is of the same spirit as Andre's uh, theorem. And uh, uh, so this is also like, uh, so let me just say that, sorry. Uh, there's a shadow, okay, I'll write here. Uh, if we uh, okay, just repeat the whole thing, but replace uh, bounded analytic function by bounded Nevan-Lina characteristic. So I'll say now, so this is now a quite non-trivial arithmetic algebraization theorem. Uh, and so I'll start expla uh, explaining how this can be useful for various things. So, uh, okay, let me first state the theorem. Suppose I have an integer power series which has a representation uh, as a, uh, on the unit disk as a quotient g of z over h of z, uh, where g and h are bounded analytic functions with complex coefficients on the unit disk. So it's... Uh, the same kind of uh, thing, but with holomorphic replaced by meromorphic. And then, similarly, the conclusion holds, uh, so I stress that I have a integer coefficient series. Uh, and then uh, f must be a rational function. So it's, of course, intersection with the integer power series ring. And that's a characterization, of course, of the rational functions. Uh, and although this is uh, uh, trivial to prove, uh, it's exactly the same idea and the same principle in this theorem, which uh, is uh, essentially in some form due to uh, weaker form 
to Salem in, uh, and uh, in this refined form, I should give credit to Shanfi and uh, David Cantor. And uh, this is from the 19, the last one is from 1950s. Uh, and uh, so the, uh, so how does one use an integrality hypothesis in this kind of results? Here, uh, here the, the principle is that, so let's say the sketch of this proof, I'll just give the main point is that when one has a suitable determinant, these uh, Hankel determinants, uh, i plus j, i j zero to n, and the result is really analytic that uh, this condition of a, has a, uh, quotient representation like of a bounded analytic function implies that these uh, determinants are less than one in magnitude for large n. And, uh, and that, that is enough for the theorem. So it's, uh, so, but uh, integrality comes in, of the coefficients comes into conflict with this if you assume that the coefficients are integers. Therefore, all those determinants uh, must, val uh, must vanish and, and this classical theorem, the Kronecker determinant of criterion for the uh, rational function coefficients in terms of the vanishing of these Hankel determinants. Uh, and I only sketch, uh, so this is a little bit sidewise to my main applications, but because this is one of maybe the most uh, uh, one of the most amazing applications of arithmetic algebraization theorems in, uh, uh, that goes back to, okay, the theorem of Salem. It has other proofs, but this is one, uh, that the set of Pisan numbers are closed on the uh, interval one infinity, oh, in R. So in the real topology. So the Pisan numbers are those uh, algebraic integers, like the square, the like square root five minus one of plus one over two, all of whose conjugates belie strictly. Uh, so, so sorry, all of whose conjugates lie strictly inside the open unit disk. So there's only one Galois conjugate outside of the disk, which is real and bigger than one. And if you take limits, uh, the, the limit is a Pisa number. So how does that fit into the scheme? Uh, it is by, uh, so if you have these Pisa polynomials, the minimal polynomial of some Pisa numbers, lambda n, and uh, so you suppose you have a limit lambda, you want to show that lambda is also a Pisa number. Uh, and so the Pisa, so one basically attaches uh, the, these rational functions, uh, Pn divided by the reciprocal polynomial. Uh, so unlike for, and that's where the method of course completely breaks down for Salem numbers. Uh, here the reciprocal, the, the Pn are not reciprocal. We get a non-constant function, which by assumption, which has integer uh, Taylor expansion. And uh, one takes, uh, it has only one pole, well, at the reciprocal of this uh, lambda n. Uh, and so one verifies, I just uh, sketch the main point that uh, with a suitable residue, there's a kappa in uh, some uh, complex number on one minus lambda in x. So that this function is a bounded analytic function on the disk, uh, on the complex unit disk. Uh, and so, but if we had a, uh, so we have this uh, limit, and, uh, and hence one shows that the Fn's upon passing, so by, uh, sorry, by, by using uh, normality, so, uh, uh, so we can extract a convergence subsequence of this sequence, and in the limit, F must preserve the integrality coefficients property. We have some coefficient-wise limit of integer power series, the limit function should be also with integer coefficients, and it should be also of this form. Uh, uh, and so one, sorry, uh, one, uh, one, it's not hard to, to get the conclusion uh, for the, uh, the limit uh, must be 
of the form Q of, uh, must be a rational function by the algebraic criterion. And then Q is a Pisot polynomial with uh, root lambda and Q tilde is its reciprocal. Uh, okay, so this, um, now uh, this is just meant to be some uh, illustration of the usefulness of this kind of criteria. And now I go to uh, proving this theorem on the board, Andre's theorem. I'll give an elementary proof and then I'll upgrade it to derive uh, uh, what we need for the unbounded denominators conjecture uh, by the same principle. And the principle is uh, a, just the elementary box principle, like the whole uh, Ziegel's uh, 1929 paper, uh, which gave birth to the subject of the affinity geometry, as we know it, with the finiteness of integral points on irrational affine algebraic curves. He also proved that uh, the zeros of the Bessel function are transcendental. All of this is conceived as an application of, uh, like he, uh, formalizing the two easy lemma and uh, some application of the box principle. Here is how it works for us. So we give, okay, we have this uh, phi, this datum is the analytic map phi, which we assume is just some holomorphic map again, sending zero to zero and has sufficiently big conformal size that I want to exploit. Uh, this is like similar to the growth condition of these bounded analytic functions in Salem's criterion. Uh, and so uh, the Delfantin approximation part means that all these Pader approximations uh, that Ziegel considered with Ziegel's lemma uh, mean that, so okay, let me uh, do it step at a time. So what we want to prove even more than algebra is we will prove that if we have solutions, if I have an n-tuple of uh, m-tuple, say, of uh, formal functions with integer coefficients, m form of our series, uh, and so with the properties, the property is that for this common phi, so this phi is fixed at the beginning, and I'll give a finiteness uh, theorem in a minute, so suppose that for the same phi, the pullbacks of the FIs are all holomorphic on the unit disk. Holomorphic, of course, means just convergent power series. So this, uh, so this is kind of a Delphantin approximation problem that I try to solve given phi, how many functions can we find uh, that few in that, so to speak, that template uh, of uh, getting simultaneous uniformization by phi. Uh, and of course, there are infinitely many. We can take one if, if it raise it to powers. But uh, so uh, we suppose the FIs are linearly independent, not over Q, but over the rational functions. So that would be our finiteness theorem then. So linearly independent. So uh, and then. Uh, we will show, we will give an explicit upper bound on this uh, main tool in, in, in our work on unbounded denominators uh, is uh, what we call holonomy uh, rank bounds for some other reasons to give bounds on the maximum number M of such functions. So we, we will uh, bound the dimension of the QX linear span of all the Fs in Andre's criterion and similar uh, kind of the funding problems when the datum, given the datum fee. So how do we do that? This will be a pretty elementary proof, by the way, uh, for, for this uh, uh, purpose. So that implies algebraicity because I can just consider the powers of a fixed uh, F. We have a linear dependence over Q of X, so they must, it must be algebraic. Uh, and I will uh, introduce two, uh, two parameters uh, integers uh, for the box principle. I'll call them uh, H and D. And I'll consider an input set that will be uh, tuples. I'll give it a name, I sub H D. These are M tuples, as many as the functions I want to, give, to place an upper bound on M. M tuples of polynomials, Q1, auxiliary polynomial functions. Uh, with uh, integer coefficients of degree less than d and coefficients integers uh, belonging to uh, interval zero to h. 
So of course, there are h plus 1 to the power of d such options, which I want to pigeonhole to construct a good Rassler approximation to f. So I put an, oh, sorry, good uh, approximate relation between our putative functions fi. I'll express this as follows. I also introduce an output set on the same parameters, h and d. And this will be the set of all outcomes as form of power series of the functions f of x, traditionally the, uh, these auxiliary functions, like in Gelfond's method, but here it's very elementary. Uh, okay, so I have these auxiliary polynomials qi, multiply them by my function, formal functions fi, sum i from one to m, and let's give uh, the name for the, this Taylor series, uh, sum b of m x to the m. So this is in uh, z of x. And uh, so if you assume that the functions are linearly uh, independent, then uh, the number of inputs must be bigger than, can, okay, the number of inputs can't be bigger than the number of outputs. Uh, and finally, okay, so uh, we, uh, we want to place an upper bound on, uh, on M that will guarantee that we have more inputs strictly than outputs. Uh, and the key point is that suppose we have uh, agreement of uh, F1 and F2 up to uh, order N. So that means that, uh, so the leading coefficient is some integer C and higher order terms, and C is some non-zero integer, uh, and therefore at least uh, one in absolute value. Uh, and then by, uh, so using the analytic uniformization uh, phi, we we express in the z-coordinate and the leading coefficient becomes very large plus higher order. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the, by Cauchy's formula, we express this leading coefficient as an integral over the unit circle of uh, z to the minus n times this difference v equals f2 minus f1 pulled back by phi, which we assume is analytic, and integrated in the unif uniform measure on the circle. And just by placing the upper bound along the contour, we give uh, the following upper bound on the, po on the leading order coefficient. And you see that it gets very strong when the size, conformal size of phi, this derivative, is very positive. So this is bounded above by some linear term in the degree parameter, essentially the maximal of, the, of this integral of the, okay, so, so some O of D uh, plus log of the number of terms plus O of one with uh, only depending on phi and the Fi. Uh, and so the upshot is, so we are near the completion of this elementary proof is that given, so if you look at the nth coefficient of this auxiliary function, bn, if you already know the first n minus one, the previous coefficients, so given b, you know, so b minus n minus one, uh, has at most, uh, well, it's an integer, so it has uh, at most that many options. Uh, so I rewrite this some exponential in D, so some constant that depends on phi. Uh, this comes from the number of terms. Uh, but the main point is this factor that pull, uh, pulls everything down. And so eventually all these uh, coefficients are determined by the previous uniquely. There's at most one option. This is the extrapolation in traditional uh, transcendence proofs. And finally, okay. We just compare the parameter count and we get the theorem. So we get 
I already gave you the output options, essentially h to the md, and uh, the number the number of outputs then is at most by this argument, and this is the key point that I want to connect to to the next method, uh, slopes method. Uh, in this elementary decomposition by Taylor series is an infinite product, and infinite it really has only finitely many terms with flow bigger than one, but it's just convenient as a tool, notational tool. This ex explicit uh, expression, and one just checks that where delta is strictly less than one. This is the reciprocal of the derivative of phi strictly smaller than one. And finally, okay, so you do the, uh, I won't spare the calculation, you just take d equals e to the h, and, uh, and then this uh, output is smaller than e to the sum uh, implicit coefficient times d squared plus nd. And now one shows, one sees that, well, uh, for these parameters, we have uh, finally inputs uh, e to the m d squared. So we just need m to exceed this implicit coefficient that was here. And that places, and that's computable, uh, essentially by supremum of f of phi, uh, and uh, proves an uh, quantitative upper bound on on the degree of algebraicity or, uh, so this, okay, let's uh, uh, put the end of proof mark here. This proves Andre's criterion. Now the point, uh, now I'll state our refinement of this. And the proof principle will be very similar, but we need to do the geometry of numbers more precise, and this is where the boss slopes inequality from Elementary hierarchical theory is very useful. In our paper, by the way, on uh, the we uh, on the boundary denominators conjecture, we give uh, elementary treatment, uh, which only uses the Ziegel lemma, but we have to work with uh, many variables. Uh, similarly, vaguely to the proof of Ross theorem, that the number of variables needs to go to infinity to kill off a Dirichlet exponent, but uh, we. Uh, it turns out that one can do a, a purely one variable uh, Delphantin proofs. Okay, so here's the theorem. This is our main lemma, uh, which is behind uh, the results I sketched in the first talk. All of this, of course, is our joint work with Frank Caligari, uh, myself, Yu Jun Tang. I'd say 2021. For this one, maybe the improved version. Okay, so it states the following. Uh, so let me be more, uh, put some other things so I can apply it. So I'll start with, suppose we have some x of t, some power, slightly more complicated than Andre's theorem, but certainly a generalization, a form of power series that is normalized by t with coefficient one, plus higher order terms with rational coefficients. So this is one datum, piece of the datum. Uh, suppose also we have this phi again. Uh, from, okay, so uh, unit disk pointed at zero to C. And this uh, essentially indispensable condition for all, uh, we do here that the conformal size is strictly bigger than one. Although at the first theorem I illustrated with Salem, we had conformal size equal to one kind of a borderline case and then replace it by a growth condition that the function was a quotient of two bounded analytic functions. That's a direction that may, we have not sufficiently explored, but it's similar in spirit to this. Okay, so there's this, this uh, otherwise if I put conformal size equal to one, uh, we will not be able to say anything. There will be an infinite dimension, continuing dimensional solution space in the following. So we have this datum, uh, and then I'll consider then uh, um, rational coefficients power series P of X, uh, non-constant. Uh, 
and here I start to play this kind of game of combining uh, integrality condition, hypothesis with analytic continuation properties. So the integrality one is that the pullback of P on the, of, on the X of T, so that means I take P substitute by X of T, which is legit, legitimate because of this. Uh, I get an integer power series. And uh, uh, the pullback by phi is analytic. So these two. I use this for varying of analytic functions on the unit complex disk. Um, so the solution in, in the framework of Boston and Shah, these uh, data defines a formal analytic arithmetic surface and we look for neuromorphic functions on that surface. I state this in a, uh, our more elementary terms for the application. Then, uh, uh, finally, we consider the O, the F with those similar properties, same properties. So, formal power series, which share the, uh, so we fix one of the solutions, which is P, and, and then F is, satisfies the same. Then uh, they span Okay, let's say their linear span over the rational functions. Again, is finite dimensional. And I'll now write down uh, explicit, sorry, I'll sit here, dimension bound for that linear span. Let me state three versions. So firstly, uh, the version we, uh, one finds in our original paper with the elementary methods. There is some absolute constant, which was E coming from this infinite variables uh, approach. But then it's not important for the applications we had. Um, the key point is that uh, we have a quotient where we have a Nevanlina characteristic on top, so that's the inter it's technically in Nevalina proximity at infinity for uh, the holomorphic, uh, for the uh, map phi at the radius one. However, phi is holomorphic here, so that is uh, Nevalina characteristic. And divided by the log of the conformal size, which we assume is strictly positive. So this is some finite quotient, and it's an upper bound, explicit upper bound on this kind of uh, argument that I, elementary argument that I sketched when it's done properly with the full force of geometry of numbers in Arakel of, uh, in both slopes method, for example, or even in our uh, elementary framework, you get this constant. Uh, then, uh, in fact, uh, okay, with, with the BOST method, uh, we get the constant of two, times the same quotient. And uh, that's the intermediate result, but the most precise result in this framework is, uh, was done uh, very recently by Boston Shah, uh, which implies uh, all the previous. So the correct bound, uh, which requires uh, some arithmetic intersection theory to prove, uh, is uh, by the double integral over the unit dimensional torus of log absolute. <clears throat> so let me, okay, uh, so I have to apologize that I didn't uh, use all the, uh, okay, uh, this is true if we had x of t equals t and p of x equals x, let me, the, the, cor the general statement, uh, sorry, uh, it's the Q of P linear span, and then I take uh, the Nevalina characteristic of the map P composed by phi, which was assumed to be holomorphic in every way in this. 
And here, similarly, p of phi of z for this double integral minus p of phi of w in the uniform measure of the torus. The same bottom. I apologize for, I get, I lost track of the starting time. Uh, I think you should be able to talk about the end of Okay. So I wrap up, yes, I, I, yes. So, um, okay, I, uh, okay, uh, I will wrap this up by, uh, so, um, so let's point out that uh, if uh, we have uh, just this example, uh, of the of this post and shower bound uh, so for instance one recovers the uh, cl uh, very classical theorem of poya uh, if we have a injective mapping phi sending zero to zero with derivative strictly bigger than one uh, and then uh, so, uh, f is analytic on the image of phi uh, implies that f is a rational function. This is because the quotient is actually equal to one. And the space is one dimensional. And so the wrap up of this uh, discussion is that we uh, apply these uh, quantitative bounds on the uh, spaces of holon holonomic functions which we construct out of the modular forms by replacing the Q expansions by the expansions in the coordinate x equal to lambda over 16. And then uh, we uh, have uh, automatic analyticity properties by, uh, by the linear differential equation or local system that uh, uh, when we, in the coordinate x. Uh, and so the, basically the whole point is that we count uh, how many functions we have modular for congruence groups and we count how many, how many functions, we, sorry, uh, we have uh, with an integral Q expansion and uh, modular for some finite index subgroup of SL to Z, organize everything by a parameter N so that we get, which is a form of a level, we get uh, finite dimensional spaces and prove that uh, this uh, space is not much larger than, uh, so, so uh, we get an upper bound that compares in this sense uh, n-cubed congruence examples and a sufficiently sharp bound on all of the uh, uh, non-congruence forms. Uh, and uh, then we uh, so extrapolate to to prove that in the end there are no examples at all. So this is the conclusion that uh, if we have one counterexample uh, uh, which is not a congruence modular form, we get many others by using various primes and replacing f of tau by f of tau over p. So by using this theorem and this construction, in the end, a single counterexample breaks the explicit dimension bound. And uh, that uh, wraps up. Uh, section one of talk, the first talk. Uh, the statements are uh, all applications of this dimension bound. So thank you very much for your attention. Apologies for the overtime.